So this uh, talk is about turning Drupal into an automated deployment machine. Uh, this uh, is going to be somewhat high level because we want to talk about kind of the concepts um, and why we use Drupal and the way we ended up using it. Uh, there will be uh, time for questions at the end. So if you have more <laughs> deep dive questions or you want to know something specific, uh, we're certainly happy to answer those questions. Um, but it felt like going on to the command line level detail wasn't going to serve of the broad audience uh, here at DrupalCon. Um, so a little bit about us. Uh, I'm Peter Willannon. I've worked at Acquia six years or so now. Um, we've done a lot of Drupal development also, so. Uh, That's an understatement. A, a up there in the ranks for Drupal six, seven, and eight uh, contributions. Um, and uh, did a lot of work on the Drupal integration with Apache Solar, which is kind of uh, <coughs> Uh, one of the things that I'm known for and then uh, that Nick has become known for also more recently. <laughs> um, my name is Nick, Nick Fienhoff. Um, I'm now based in Ghent. And um, I started three years ago in Acquia as an internship with Peter as my mentor. Um, so he was my, my guide and, and teacher in everything solar, uh, but also the server infrastructure in Acquia. And it proved a really interesting challenge for me because I wasn't very skilled in infrastructure. It was more software development. Um, you can find more about me in Twitter at NickVH or just Google my name, I guess. And, and Nick is also famous because he appeared in the DrupalCon Goes to Paris video. If anyone has watched <laughs> that video series, look for Nick. <laughs> OK, so uh, enough introduction. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about where we started. So as Nick said, he came in uh, as an intern, um, and he has basically taken this service that we built uh, that has a lot of um, infrastructure deployment and moved it to the next level. But I want to tell you where we started um, to motivate sort of the talk. Uh, so at the point where we sort of reached a crisis and knew we had to rebuild it uh, kind of from scratch. So we had a lot of servers uh, and a lot of search indexes. So we, had, we were managing thousands of search indexes. Acquia had grown, and we were basically giving one search index uh, for every customer for every uh, that signed up for a subscription, including free subscriptions. Um, and to deploy all these, obviously, we needed hundreds of different servers running. We had load balancers in front of the servers. Um, but we were also running into a problem that as our uh, base expanded, we had people that wanted to deploy their Drupal sites in other regions of the world. So people wanted to deploy their Drupal sites in Asia, in Australia, uh, even in Europe. Um, and our service wasn't uh, really able to service them because we had built it um, without that in mind. Uh, so in particular, we, uh, I had originally built this service together with uh, Jacob Singh. So if anyone knows Jacob, uh, he's now actually uh, in India uh, building up our, our presence there. But uh, he and I had worked together uh, for about half a year uh, through mid-2009 and rolled out the service. And, you know, both of us, in a sense, it was, you know, our first time doing something like that. So uh, this is kind of a, a little bit of a, will be a little bit of a list of mistakes we made in hindsight. Um, um, so we didn't really know how to, that it was going to scale. We didn't really have that in mind. We just wanted to ship it. Uh, you've all been there, right? Um, but by the time uh, Nick arrived, that was leading to a lot of operational stress and a lot of development friction. So we couldn't uh, deploy new features for customers. We couldn't go to new regions uh, because we were basically hampered by the legacy infrastructure that we'd built. Um, so this is kind of a, I, I picture That's Nick me. as like that yeah. guy, and he's trying to fix our service. He has to stick his hand down that really dirty machinery, and he's risking getting his fingers cut off every time he has to fix something. And I didn't study mechanics, so <laughs> that, that was more of an issue. I had um, no clue. Right, so in order to preserve Nick's fingers so he didn't have to get so dirty, uh, so we could make people happy, um, uh, we needed to fix things. So let me, let me tell you about why the machinery was broken. Um, so one of the, the, even from the start, reasons that it was obvious the machinery was broken was that we used a polling model uh, to update uh, and deploy. So if you've uh, ever built a service, this is kind of like the dumbest thing that you always start doing, and we'd never move beyond it. And it was just every five minutes uh, we asked our, our data source, uh, tell me about all the things that are supposed to be deployed on the server. Uh, and we would check if there was something new, and if there was something new, we would deploy it. Um, so that was annoying for a lot of reasons. The biggest one was that customers weren't happy because they would ask uh, to connect to one of the search indexes, and we would 
want to deploy it for them, but it might not be there for five or 10 minutes, meaning in the meantime, Drupal was giving them error messages saying that the search index was not available. Um, so that was a bad sort of onboarding experience. Customers were unhappy trying to get started, and often they'd give up you know, even before the five minutes was up. Um, with this uh, mechanism where the server is just uh, pat, you know, pulling in the data and doesn't have any other interaction, uh, it was hard to see when an error occurred. So we didn't have a good way to see that whatever data we'd sent over wasn't you know, correctly formatted or uh, the, you know, the server itself had some error. Uh, so we need a lot of you know, manual auditing and checking, uh, constant tweaking to make sure that this system was working. In addition to that deployment problem uh, of the poll model, uh, it led to a scaling problem. So as I said, we were getting to hundreds of different servers. Each of those hundred different servers, hundreds of different servers, uh, were calling to our data store every five minutes uh, and downloading a lot of data. This uh, data store uh, was a different Drupal site. So you can imagine doing you know, basically uncached Drupal bootstrap, load lots of data, pull it over, and as you scale more and more servers, we're basically loading down our pr other production infrastructure in order to usually provide no updates. So we're sending data over. It doesn't, hadn't changed, but we had no way uh, to avoid uh, doing this expensive call every five minutes. So again, if you're building a service from scratch, like don't get stuck doing this uh, polling model that, that in the long run will definitely bite you as you try to scale. Uh, that's also uh, something that uh, like with our hosting platform had started the same way and we had to move away from it for exactly the same reason. That as you load down uh, your data store, uh, with each server trying to update, um, it, it simply falls over and you can't put enough hardware to just serve these useless requests. Um, another problem we had with that old infrastructure was that basically in order to uh, create a new server, someone had to go in and manually uh, configure it. Uh, in, in this case, we were actually using a service that stored the data, but you still have to go in and form and you'd have to edit the values and say this is the name that the server is going to have, this is where it's going to live. This is, uh, you know, it's sort of identifier that it will collect a group of indexes. And someone had to do that by hand, and they had to do it right every single time. Or when the server launched, you know, things broke. If they did it wrong, or if you edited it by hand later, uh, you might not be able to launch the same server again if it went down. Um, so, you know, scale, and then scaling and balancing search indexes took a long time. I don't know if you're going to talk about this, Nick. About you, balancing. Uh, balancing. I can talk about it. Yeah, so balancing in the sense here that um, we would have servers that would get overloaded. So we would you know, provision each customer, basically on, all new customers onto a single server, let's say, for our free sites. And if we weren't paying attention because we didn't have a good system to pay attention, uh, you know, we'd get too many, and the server would uh, start to be overloaded. Uh, and then someone would have to go and manually copy those indexes to another server by hand. Um, and so that you know, made us really not uh, on the good list of our mm -hmm. operations team, <laughs> shall we say, uh, or we had to do it ourselves. Um, and as I said, the relaunching uh, didn't necessarily work smoothly. Uh, so you, uh, as Nick says, might lose a server in the Amazon <laughs> uh, using, uh, you know, so e even then we were deployed on AWS. Um, uh, we redeployed in, into a different configuration on AWS. Uh, but AWS tells you things like uh, they might just send you notice, eh, we're going to reboot the server Soon, or we lost your server, or we, or or they won't even tell you. The server just goes away. If you if you run enough, as we do, you just see occasionally they just disappear. Um, <laughs> it's a virtual machine; you didn't need it. Uh, they also advise you, if you're, <laughs> you know, and this is actually really important to think about if you're using Amazon, that that they basically tell you they have multiple basically data centers within each region, and you should be your application should be prepared for a total failure of one of those data centers at any time. Um, and if you want to build a reliable uh, application on Amazon, your a application has to be prepared to suffer that loss and still keep going. Um, and, and otherwise, you know, you didn't follow their best practice. So, um, so you know, having these sort of problems where we couldn't readily relaunch, we couldn't necessarily uh, fix things that were broken, made it hard, you know, to provide customers a good uptime. And some of them liked our service a lot, so they were using it as an important feature of their Drupal sites, driving the search, you know, for their uh, e-commerce or for yeah. their you know, travel or whatever, their Even news the, section the front of their page. site. The front page like, of their site yeah. was basically driven by search results. So if our service went down for them, uh, they were very upset. Um, but we didn't have the system in place really to keep them up uh, consistently. Um, finally, as I said, we had basically a, a monitoring and distribution problem. So we had um, basically one data provider. Uh, we had uh, search servers deployed in the U.S. We were sort of experimenting, but not totally successfully, with deploying some in Europe. 
uh, and then trying to figure out how to monitor them at the same time uh, without having really a, a comprehensive system for doing this. Um, and in particular, the big problem here that we didn't actually have a single record that described what should be happening uh, for a given search index, like what server should it be deployed on, uh, who owns it, you know, what configuration does it have. This uh, information was actually split uh, between our sort of data store on the one hand that knew about the customers and the servers themselves that knew which things they were supposed to fetch and deploy. So with this split between some of the configuration on the server, some of it in the data store, we didn't have any one place that we could basically capture all this and use it to monitor the service because we didn't know, we didn't have this one piece of information to allow us to know that this index should be on this server running this configuration. Um, uh, so yes, monitoring was hard. <laughs> and as I said, the instances were confined to one region, uh, so that meant customers had high latency if they tried to use our service. Um, and then finally, we had a, a real friction with this problem, which is that we had hard-coded uh, basically the, the system to say that each customer gets one index. Um, and that was great when we started, it worked fine. Uh, but as we got you know, more and more customers and more and more customers with big sites, they sometimes needed two search indexes for one site or they needed you know, a development search index as well as a production one. And so we didn't have a flexible way to give that to them and so we basically had to do more and more painful workarounds uh, in order to provide them uh, the things that they needed and that seemed like it should be easy for us to do. Um, so, it didn't look good. <laughs> But Nick came yeah. in. <laughs> and and I, I panicked. Yes. Nick was a bit panicked, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I was a bit, operations was a bit panicked, but we came up with a plan. Um, and we sort of reimagined how we were going to deploy the search indexes and rebuilt the service uh, essentially from scratch. Um, and at the end, I don't think Nick's going to really talk about the migration, but basically we migrated all the customer data, all the search indexes from our old infrastructure to the new one uh, with relatively minimal downtime, and now it's running happily. Um, so a big piece of context for us in thinking about how to solve this problem, uh, for me especially, was Drupal Gardens. So I spent a lot of time on the Drupal Gardens project. And Drupal Gardens, if you don't know, uses a Drupal site as a control server for deploying other Drupal sites. And so we had successfully scaled this up, and we d had about 30,000 Drupal sites deployed. I think uh, that's about what the number is now. Um, yeah, so it was clear to us that we could scale to the tens of thousands of scale that we needed to in terms of deploying something using Drupal as the, the control layer. Uh, if you want to see uh, more about that, I, I have a couple links here. Obviously, we'll post the slides um, uh, just about what that service does and how it works. Um, and then the other piece of context that probably a lot of you know is Agear. So Agear is a Drupal uh, set of modules and scripts, basically, that deploy Drupal sites, again. So we have this model of Drupal being the machine that deploys other Drupal sites. And so we thought, well, why don't we take the advantages of that sort of system and apply it to something that's totally different um, and turn it into a machine for deploying Apache Solar uh, search indexes. So we kind of took a step back and thought about what is the ideal characteristics of such a system. Um, and I think this was very important because remember we had those sort of pain points uh, where we had friction in development and operations and we wanted to avoid running into those again as we scaled it out. Um, so in particular we wanted to make this uh, system independent of anything else uh, at Acquia. So we basically, through discussions, um, came to the conclusion it should be decoupled from our hosting platform, it should be decoupled from our customer-facing portal, uh, it should really be a standalone thing, um, so we're going to interact with it through an API and not uh, couple it together directly with the data uh, or with the, any customer-facing service. Uh, the advantage of that is also that this system becomes testable, so we can spin up this Drupal site uh, and run tests just against the API. We can potentially spin this Drupal site up and run system tests uh, where it's going to deploy search indexes. And we don't have to deploy the entire rest of the Acquia uh, infrastructure, all the Acquia sites, uh, to do this. It's a standalone thing. Uh, so it's really a black box from the standpoint of other teams at Acquia. So they uh, can basically make an API request that says, please give me a new search index for this customer with this name, with these credentials, uh, and it just works. They don't have to think about how and why it works under the, under the hood, and if we, in the future, had to change this out and, you know, rewrite this service in Java, as long as the API stayed the same, the rest of Aqua wouldn't have to even be aware that we made that change. Not that I'm planning to, but hypothetically. <laughs> um, uh, we also had a goal that we wanted to basically reuse our, our own hosting platform. Uh, so 
you know, I've spent time on the hosting team as well as on Drupal Gardens. I mean, Drupal Gardens is really now called Acquia Cloud Site Factory because it is, it is essentially just a, a wrapper on top of our hosting platform. Um, so we also wanted, in, in a sense, to reuse the hosting platform, be a, a customer of, of our own internal hosting platform and not have to reinvent all that infrastructure. Um, and one of the, the caveats about using that, of course, is that it's designed to host Drupal. So getting us back to why we might uh, use Drupal as the machine. Um, finally, both Nick and I you know, have contributed a lot over the years. And um, you know, we had in mind as an important goal, not as an engineering goal, but as, as sort of a, a, a values goal, uh, both to use, reuse, contribute uh, the code involved in this project uh, so that we wouldn't be isolated from the community. So you know, a lot of what Nick's going to talk about is how we use different Drupal modules to actually carry out the tasks uh, necessary to do these deployments. Well, and not only Drupal modules, but also packages or uh, libraries that you could use outside of Drupal. Yep. So um, just to kind of summarize why, why we picked Drupal you know, for this project as, as the sort of uh, control, control machine. Um, so yeah, we're very familiar with it. Probably a lot of you guys are familiar with Drupal. Um, it gives us a UI, so if you just started writing a bunch of scripts, you wouldn't have a UI where you can go in and inspect the data, debug it, tweak it. Um, Drupal is really good at you know, basically using content, or the content is data, right? So Drupal really just has a data-driven model of behavior, um, and that means you can use the data to do anything, including that data can represent uh, these things that you're deploying, and we'll talk more about that. But that, um, if you haven't thought about that concept, hopefully that's one of Drupal's main advantages over a lot of its competitors. Um, we also had experience uh, using things like services module to synchronize this data or content uh, between Drupal sites so that we knew that we could keep uh, the configuration, for example, for a search index, we could then basically synchronize it back to the customer facing portal uh, if we needed to so the customers could actually see the up-to-date status of the search index, again, without coupling these two systems, but we could synchronize back uh, and have an update report. Um, of course, because it's Drupal, there's lots of modules we could integrate uh, into a stock Drupal 7 site and customize it very quickly. Um, and, you know, things like views make it very easy to build reports, um, look up customer statistics. Uh, and again, sort of this debugging uh, and development process became a lot faster using Drupal as the centerpiece of this rather than basically a bunch of shell scripts, which is what we had before. So um, That's to summarize. Yes, to summarize, <laughs> basically Nick and I came up with this plan. And then to a large extent, uh, Nick went off and attacked this problem uh, and implemented uh, the plan that we'd come up with. So let me uh, hand I it I tried to 42, you. but that didn't work. So, <laughs> All right. Um, does everyone know from which movie or which book this quote is? Exactly. <laughs> so that was a trivia. I don't know if there's a Drupal trivia here this week. Yeah, Thursday. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, so now we know all these problems. Um, you probably are kind of curious, okay, how did they actually solve that or why Drupal or has this whole architecture? And um, we'll mainly go into the, the Drupal or the machine side of this problem. Two years ago, we already gave a, a talk about how we did that infrastructure using Puppet and uh, a bunch of the, the whole solar replication stuff. So that's not what we're going to talk about here. If you do want to do that or if you want to see um, how that works, there's a presentation from two years ago. Um, so, oh yeah, there, uh, <laughs> but that, that kind of point. So um, we talked about that data provider, so that's where all our customer data um, comes from, and that customer data um, knows how many search indexes we have for each customer, or which region it lives in, that kind of stuff. So it sends an API call to our governor, and we call it a governor because it kind of governs the whole search um, infrastructure. And once it's in there, it actually adds it to a queue. And the queue is, is kind of interesting in this sense because it's a, a finite state machine that has multiple states. Um, so when you add an index, you have a couple of states. So first you add it, you check it, you make sure that the config is right. Uh, so it, if you all do that in one task, if something fails, it's really hard to actually find out what failed. So um, I'd highly recommend you make small tasks um, then it goes back, and as you can see, this little governor at, uh, from ours is doing a couple of things. First, it sends out SSH commands to the appropriate servers of that index. 
um, and the appropriate servers are actually being auto um, defined by this deployment machine. It tries to find out where do I have space, where should I go to. Um, it tries to be smart. It's not AI, but it, it tries to be smart. <laughs> um, and it does that for the, the solar master, the solar slave. It configures also the, um, the whole extractor. So all of that logic is being done by SSH commands. Um, to make sure that we can balance to these right machines, we needed Nginx. And Nginx is a little tricky to configure because it uses Nginx config files. And we came up with a way to actually deploy these config files on a whole set of balancers at the same time using a git deployment machine, like git deployment um, mechanism. So we commit to one repo within our uh, Drupal um, deployment machine, and it automatically deploys on uh, this set of balancers. So we also know that the file is always the same, and if it's for some reason we need to spin up a new balancer, we spin it up, the git clone happened, bam, we have a new balancer. Um, so that's kind of the, the whole scheme of uh, what we're gonna talk about here. And if we dive a little deeper into Drupal, so we have a couple of content types that we defined. One is a search index, there's a server, um, there's a cluster and a search config set. All of these are uh, being linked to each other using uh, entity reference. Um, so you can really get a whole view of what's connected to what. Um, are there any questions about the definition of these words? Okay. So why do we really use content as our, our driver? Um, it's, it's all about content in our case. It's all about how many indexes and what, what defines that index. It's all kind of textual information. Um, and as Peter explained, Drupal is really good at that. So we created a, a bunch of API calls that accept this uh, content. Um, but you can accept certain configuration files. You could accept, okay, make me a new index. Um, so that was quite a lot of work to do that in, in Drupal, to make these API things, as I think now is commonly referred as headless Drupal, but this is still Drupal 7. Um, so that wasn't really there. Um, and yeah, this basically explains what I mentioned in the diagram. Um, okay. Are there any, well, I'll come back to the diagram later if there's any questions. Um, I'll dive into what kind of modules we actually created or used to to make these SSH calls, to make these Git uh, deployments, et cetera. Um, so there's kubernetes, SSH helper, Git wrapper, services, which probably is one of the few in this list that is known by a lot of people. Um, Composer manager and EFQ, I'll explain uh, all of them. In this whole process, the whole company was kind of looking at us and, and they saw us developing this kind of queue runner thing and, and that's also why this picture is here um, of Peter and me and Andrew Yang, a colleague of ours, send this to everyone. Hey, look, these guys doing queue runner. Um, and queue runner is a, a module that runs as a fake daemon because it's not a real daemon. It's still a PHP process. And it runs for 55 seconds in the background and it tries to run as many tasks as possible. Remember I said, keep your tasks really small. This, this really helps to get as, much as, uh, as many tasks as possible to execute. Then it waits five seconds and it starts 55 second uh, batch again. Um, and it does this over and over and over until there's no more tasks. Um, the cool thing about this queue runner as well um, is that you can use the finite state machine in there that was invented by the gardens team. So we, we try to cooperate a bit. Um, I'm not gonna go deeper into that, but if someone's interested, I can show you uh, how it works. Then we needed a way to actually execute SSH calls from within Drupal. I don't know if anyone ever tried that. No one? <laughs> how did it go? Was okay? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> like uh, error handling and that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's because typically they expect um, different histories, um, provide different environment severities. So I think mm. you kind of like have a big like, Yeah, and did you try, like, for example, SSH, uh, as, like, SSH keys yep. or yeah. that kind of stuff? So that, that's. 
Perfect. So that's what this module also tries to help you with. So it, it allows you to actually give it a certificate. Um, you can actually enter a passphrase. And it uses the PHP seclib library that's available on GitHub um, to actually make that connection. So you don't need any weird bash script to actually help you get that into memory for your SSH key, um, which what we used before. Um, and it proved to be very stable. The PHP seclib library, I would recommend you if you want to do something like this. Um, and then for the, the whole Git piece, we used to, or actually we created, um, so we also created QRunner, we created the SSH helper, so now we created the Git wrapper. Um, and Git wrapper is a, a module that was created by Chris Plakis, maybe known to some of you, uh, also the author of uh, Facet API. And what Git wrapper does is it provides you an object-oriented way of actually handling Git. So you can say, okay, create me a new repo, deploy me a new repo, uh, maybe clone this here, add this there, that kind of stuff. Um, th and it becomes really easy to then somehow programmatically handle Git calls. So we had um, this in our governor, as I explained, in this deployment machine. This is a, an abstract on, on how our Nginx uh, config file looks like. And it's an include, of course, because otherwise um, it wouldn't work. But this is what it actually spits out and writes to disk on file, then commits it to that Git repository, and then it gets deployed automatically doing this whole Git deploy uh, mechanism across all our balancers. Um, so that was a good way to scale on multiple machines. Then we have Composer Manager. Um, I'm sure it's also being used by many of you that are site developers unless my assumption is wrong. No, Composer? I, I would assume so, right? If, if not, Drupal 8 will kind of force you. Um, and Composer Manager was really useful for us because we had all these different libraries that we had, that we had to include and we wanted to keep up to date. Um, we also used it to get internal packages from Acquia uh, in our repository. And it was um, also created by Chris Plakis um, and it solves the problem that you have with multiple composer.json files. So sometimes modules come with a composer.json um, and that allows you to pull in libraries from GitHub. Um, but what if you need to use the same library twice? Then it will be added to your autoloader twice. And it, it comes with some complex problems and Composer Manager uh, merges all these composer.json files and gives you one place where all your libraries live um, and also allows you to auto-load it. And then, um, yeah, I think one but last one. It's the services and services client. And this module is actually being used to send Drupal nodes over back and forth between different uh, Drupal sites. So we have our client repository that then sends over these indexes, um, but we can also send just random uh, regular data. This one is an interesting one which gave me a lot of headwind um, from someone called CHX. I don't know if he's in the room. Um, I will not, like this module allows you to using entity fields query, um, which is normally only supposed to give you back the entity ID, uh, do some hackery and do join tables with all the rest of your entity information to get your field back. This way it's an easy way to write data structures or like data queries in Drupal and not write the MySQL queries. And it will just make one MySQL query and get you the data. Pay attention, this is not how it was intended. <laughs> this is a hack. It won't work on MongoDB. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I don't recommend it, but it's really cool. I think <laughs> yes. you should probably talk a little bit more about services because yeah. I think okay. I mentioned the synchronizing the content. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, we sort of at Aqua have, have moved to model. Yeah, have a lot of uh, this hmm. content synchronizing among multiple Drupal sites, which is we're see, we're synchronizing it, in the, it because primarily we use it as data, but it's very much the same. 
uh, system that people use to do content staging and content synchronization. Right. I mean, again, it, it is actually <clears throat> just content, right? So Drupal content is data, data is content. Uh, so if you've set up a system where you either stage or synchronize content between sites, it's exactly the same setup to keep your data, your deployment data in sync. So one site might have basically a read-only access, uh, another, or it might be read-write so that you can, your, in, in this case, our support team needs to go in and tweak a setting for the search uh, index. They tweak it in the UI. It's automatically synchronized using services module back to the governor. Governor sees the new data, does SSH call to the server, uh, and that new configuration gets yeah. deployed. It's also, so services client um, is built on top of services, and it allows you to actually select a couple of fields that are being mapped to other entity types and other, actually, other fields. So you can take a subset of your data from your customer and send it somewhere else, uh, but still keep that link. So once that other entity type is updated on the other side, it actually goes back into your original. Um, but you can specify the permissions if it only goes one way or both ways. For the, um, the, our search application, we only wanted to go one way because we wanted to make sure that we could spin up indexes that are not attached to customer's data. Um, so make sure you get that replication uh, in order. Um, so um, as I mentioned as well, we, we have a bunch of server infrastructure that um, maybe you're curious about, but I recommend you to see the other presentation. Or ask, ask um, us during the Q&A if you want. Or ask in the Q&A. Yeah. Basically, we have uh, automated um, a process to spin up servers using Puppet. Um, and we, by setting some flags, we can say, okay, this is Tomcat 6, Tomcat 7, uh, or Java 6, 7, Solar 3 or 4. Um, and operations is overly busy, but still they just copy a set of commands in a kind of a generator, and it spins up, it auto-registers using services with our data or with our um, governor, and um, then it sends an SSH command to that server, say, okay, hi, I know who you are, I'm going to configure you now. So operations no longer configures anything on the server itself. They never have to go in, and they actually should not go in. <laughs> um, because if that server goes away, we should be really quickly be able to spin that up again. Um, so this is the, the session I referenced. Um, this talks about the whole replication. Um, and some a bit more information about the APIs, how we built that. So there's a lot of confusion on how to really build an API maybe in Drupal using the services, but that's quite complex. Um, no, I really want to make it myself. I really want to fine tune that one API on my Drupal site. And you all know hook menu, right? I hope so, yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's, um, there's a small trick, and maybe it's not very known. It's called the delivery callback. And um, you can set it to Drupal JSON output. So then if you make a page callback, and you give it back an array, it will automatically convert it to JSON. So then you actually have a, a menu path that spits out JSON. And that's already a good start if you want to make an API. Um, and, and using, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, you can actually, if you look at Drupal core, you'll see that this Drupal JSON output is used directly by Drupal core and things like uh, taxonomy module. Um, but by making it the delivery callback, you actually skip a bunch of other code that Drupal would run uh, every time you hit that path. Uh, so it's a way basically to speed these things up because in this case, we know that there's, there's not a user interacting uh, with Drupal. There's not a session that we have to care about tracking. Uh, we just want to spit out this output to the correctly authenticated consumer. Um, so this API is also used by customers to, it's, it's still a very small subset. Um, but actually to add, for example, stop words or protected words or that kind of configuration changes using regular JSON that we can control because if we allow customers to send in real files that are directly deployed, that's a security issue. Um, we're still testing that feature um, internally. All of our customer support already have access to that feature and they just add these files and it gets automatically deployed and here you can see that the concept of a black box becomes really useful. There's only a really smart part that your support engineers need to know to actually deploy files on the whole infrastructure. 
They never have to log into the servers. They don't need to know how it works, but they need to trust it. So the robustness of the system is your responsibility, basically. Um, so for example, we used Swagger to uh, describe the APIs. These are all APIs that are built in, in Drupal itself. Um, but as Peter said, if we switched this out to Java, it wouldn't matter. Um, no one would know, no one would care. So we can get statistics, uh, ping, local pings, that kind of stuff. Um, a couple more points, please. I had a couple more points, okay. Um, well, yeah, so I, I kind of mentioned them already. Um, but for example, operations, they have to monitor each index. And if you have 4,000 indexes, that's kind of tricky to monitor if all of them actually are online on your master and your slave and they actually work. So also using this API, um, they can get all the details from these indexes and call the ping command. And as soon as one goes down, their Nagios will actually start alerting, okay, hi, uh, this is down. And if they want to analyze, they also use the API to get an analytics uh, schema to see, okay, where is this one? Uh, how do I go in? What's the username? Um, so they get that single piece of information that they need to know to actually resolve the problem. Um, so really tailored to their needs, tailored to support's needs, tailored to engineering's needs. Um, I think that's it. And um, we're very happy to answer some questions about details that might not be very clear to you. And I hope you got something from this talk. If you have uh, questions, maybe come to the front. So I don't know if there's a microphone. Come yeah. to the mic if you can, or we'll repeat the question if you can't. Yeah. Um, so why did you guys insist on uh, using SSH for deployment for the solar service? Why didn't you, for example, since you already use Puppet, uh, not deploy your own role daemon that responds to API calls to do the configuration on the solar system itself, so you didn't have to use sure. uh, the entire SSH wrapper thing? So th that's a good question, um, and that's actually because we are deployed on Aquia Cloud, mm -hmm. and Aquia Cloud is a, a separate project that has to accommodate to a lot of other projects. So we don't have ultimate control over the Puppet uh, configuration. So what it does is it does deploy Tomcat, it does deploy Java, but what you do with that Tomcat, that's your problem. Um, this is also a way to not get like a massive team um, because it's, it's really hard to scale if you have to accommodate for each and every product. So it's also um, the, in this case, Nick didn't really go into details, but we're actually just using the SSH really as a trigger. Mm -hmm. So the, the configuration scripts are, are there locally uh, on the server, the deployed also from, from Git, as well as uh, the war file for solar and everything it needs right. uh, to run. And so we basically just go over and say, uh, there's an update you know, get the data and do the update. And so it's not that we're actually sending a lot of commands over SSH, mm -hmm. it's really just like a triggering mechanism. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah. The, um, the application itself that does that whole trick, like the whole command thing is actually Ruby on the server itself. And and actually that's a, that's the part we didn't really update that much from, as, as a dirty secret. Yeah, <laughs> it, it worked from, from before. Are there any other questions? No? All right. Oh, there's one. Um, one isn't so much a question, but I've been using Drupal as a deployment management system, primarily deploying and managing Drupal clubs for Smart Asia at WS Tools. And okay, yeah. two systems today, I've got a box in the Windows tech room, which I think is D001. So it's people who are interested in learning about another deployment system built using Drupal. Okay, thank you. Um, also, an obligatory slide. Um, <laughs> so we're hiring. We do fun stuff in Acquia. Um, I still need some colleagues in the Ghent office, but we need a bunch more in Burlington, in Boston. Um, so please come to anyone who has that blue shirt um, if you want a challenging job. <laughs> okay. Um, there's... A
So, right. So, so the question is, yeah, can we, can we just check on cron? And that that was so. Yeah, at the beginning, I don't know if you saw the first slides. That's where we started the system. And the problem is, the if you just run on cron every one minute or every five minutes, you have two problems. One is that the speed with which you deploy is a lot slower than you actually want it to be. Um, so the lag between a customer asking for something and getting it, if it's five minutes, is often too long. Um, and then the other problem is that every server. And as we're scaling now, you know, I don't know how many hundreds we have running. Indexes? No, ser servers. There's around three to 400 servers. So 400 servers. So every, if every one of these servers every minute makes an API call to get data, the load of that creates operational problems. Uh, so it, it, it's a reasonable way to start uh, building. But yeah, you don't want to continue that no. in the long term to, for scaling. And you only have like. 60 intervals per hour <laughs> because cron doesn't do half a minute as far as I remember. Um, so please also give us some feedback if you want uh, here. And there's uh, stickers from a Drupal camp in Ghent, which is two hours and a half away from here. It's free uh, attendance, and I'm one of the organizers, so I'd love you all to come. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>